Hey, good morning. Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, this talk is together with my colleague, Sang Huang. Uh, we're both based from uh, Taiwan. So uh, I actually came quite a long way. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a 15 hour flight. So uh, a little bit about me and my background, it's gonna help the talk. Uh, I started um, getting into reversing software in grade school and in programming. I've been programming ever since then. Uh, I did my bachelor's and master's in Taiwan in NCTU. Uh, and then after I graduated, I picked a four years mandatory military service at Academia Sinica. Um, it's Taiwan's number one government-backed research center. Uh, so it's a four-year term for us serving at the office uh, and two years uh, with the troops. So I chose a four-year term at the office doing cyber defense-related research, during which time uh, I was, our team was responsible for defending against uh, our heavily attacked infrastructure um, from China. And during which time I also did a PhD also in uh, cybersecurity uh, in National Taiwan University. And the PhD was on formal methods, so model checking and theorem proving, applied to identifying vulnerabilities inside source code. So we wrote all these compilers to compile source code um, and then try to use these algorithms to find vulnerabilities, vulnerable code sections. Um, I then took that research and applied to uh, US patents. And then I raised some funding from the Bay Area and started a company called Armorize. Um, so we initially started to write all these compilers uh, to find vulnerabilities. We also did a lot of pen testing and security review uh, to find vulnerabilities for many of the largest uh, websites worldwide. Um, and where we saw just a lot of attacks, a lot of backdoors, uh, many, many ways uh, where the attackers were um, profiting from hacking these really large websites. Uh, Armorize then uh, started doing sandboxing for malware, so we branched into um, building many different technologies to detect advanced malware, especially uh, malware that's developed by advanced attackers and state-backed actors. And that was uh, what got us sold to ProofPoint uh, for, we, we sold pretty well. So I started working for ProofPoint. We, uh, our team had been there for the past five years. Uh, and um, at ProofPoint, we, uh, we built a new product called Target Attack Protection that is now serving uh, nine of the top US banks, 54 out of the, out of the Fortune 100. I recently left ProofPoint. Um, to do something else. I haven't uh, really thought, uh, really decided what to do yet. Uh, I speak frequently at security conferences and um, our talks are quite unique because we operate out of Taiwan and because of our unique background as a team, what we, we ended up doing is uh, we have been tracking various group of actors for a very long time and these include state-based uh, attackers. And uh, we eventually started to compromise all of their infrastructure so that we can get all of the tools. And in our talks, we'll always disclose these tools. We'll show the source code. We basically show step-by-step step how they run their operations. When they report to work, what do they do? Um, how do they plant their backdoors? What does their tool look like? How does their source code look like? And how, how do these code base gets developed um, and advanced over time? So that's the type of research that we have been doing uh, in the past few years. Um, today, this morning, I wasn't gonna pull my talk, but I did pull one talk uh, in Black Hat 2008, I believe, where we were gonna uh, disclose our research on 13 uh, Chinese state-backed groups, uh, which was uh, not commonly known at the time, but due to pressure, we, uh, I had to pull that talk. Um, and I also have had uh, quite some experience dealing with uh, intelligence organizations worldwide, um, giving me a lot of pressure, locking me in rooms, and trying to get a lot of info without giving me a subpoena. 
And so our ethics is um, we do work with the law enforcement. If you want uh, information, uh, they, uh, we're willing to work with any law enforcement, but you have to give us a subpoena. Uh, at Proofpoint, we're a cloud-based email security provider, so uh, Apple is our customer. Every, every one of your iCloud.com emails goes through um, our servers before they make it to Apple servers. Uh, Facebook is a customer. Many, many large brands are our customers. And uh, over time, of course, there would be intelligence agencies that uh, hope to access some emails. Um, and um, my own policy when I get called is um, you, have to, you have to really have all the paperwork in place. And um, up until now, I haven't, I've, I've received all the pressure, but I've not had an opportunity to go through that process because no subpoena was ever given to me. Um, after I sold my company, Armorize to Proofpoint, I also invested as an angel investor into seven startups. Uh, so that is also something that I'm passionate about. All startups are software-based and angel round. I then started to also invest in ICOs. I do hold quite a bit of Bitcoin. Um, this is not an investment advice, but I'm very bullish about Bitcoin. And as the price dropping, I keep on buying. Uh, so uh, that's my stake right now. Um, I am going to start something in the crypto economy uh, space. Uh, and uh, the company is named XREX. We don't know exactly what we're going to do yet. All right, so this talk, uh, we're going to overview what we have seen in the real world. It first started out uh, with a lot of my friends that are running large businesses in the crypto space, getting hacked for a lot of money, millions. Um, and because I'm known as a cybersecurity expert, um, they come to me. So over time, I have handled uh, many of these attacks, these incidents. Uh, I have also, in one case, uh, worked with a local law enforcement as they were breaking into um, an office. Uh, and um, after fetching the logs, uh, we looked at the logs and um, took us about two hours. And then we told the law enforcement that we're, we're willing to testify that from our uh, professional opinion, uh, there, the, the crypto assets were not lost due to outside attack. There was no outside breach. One of the insiders definitely took the assets. And in this case, uh, because of this, the, the CEO himself um, later um, admitted to, to taking the assets. Okay, so. Um, in real world, so what, what exactly uh, is happening? Can we, can we kind of um, draw out a landscape is what I'm trying to do, we're trying to do with this talk. Uh, and because of this, uh, we have classified the current attacks seen in the wild in, into three, three categories. One is server or web application attacks. So these are attacks against server infrastructure. And they're, uh, for example, against centralized exchanges. Okay? And I've listed insider threat in this category, and I'll show you why. That's number one. Two are the individual focused attacks. So attacks that are targeted at individuals, um, malware infecting your end devices, your PCs, your mobile devices, phishing, spear phishing, um, email attacks, things like that. Any attack that's targeting individuals is listed here. And then the third one are to us security practitioners, new attacks, attacks that are, um, that are specific to blockchain, the blockchain technology and to crypto assets. And these would be, for example, consensus attacks, 51%, um, or smart contract vulnerabilities. All right, so we'll talk about the first category. Um, attacking server infrastructure, and which type of server infrastructure currently holds the most assets? These are the centralized exchanges, right? So they get hacked a lot. 
Um, and this is a graph of the notable um, compromises in the past few years uh, with CoinCheck uh, this year at more than 500 million, Mongox for 400 million, we'll talk about that, um, and the red. So when these attacks happen, they're, um, they lose quite a lot of money. And this is, this is just the crypto assets that's lost. Um, usually when, when they get hacked, they lose their business, they lose their brand. Um, if, they, if they have a token, it usually just depreciates. Um, so the actual loss is much more than um, the, the assets that's taken at the time of compromise. Okay, uh, December 2017, UBIT, uh, that's a Korean exchange. And uh, so these are just uh, some notable ones that, that appear special to us. This one is because uh, we have been tracking this actor, uh, Lazarus, for some time. And it was very apparent that by 2017, this actor was spending a lot of time um, from what they used to be doing, which is a lot of uh, um, email spare phishing, to hacking crypto exchanges. And they also, right at that time, got a big boost in terms of the quality of the tools and the exploits that they were using, probably because of the monetary return um, that they were able to benefit from targeting the crypto industry. Um, we don't have the exact logs for this case, but the consensus of the security community, it seems, is that they leveraged um, the GhostScript exploit uh, A291 to first spearfish successfully and infect uh, one of the exchange's staff's computer. And then from that computer, they were then able to get admin credentials to access a server and then root at the server. And then eventually, um, they, they moved crypto assets from that server to their wallets. And this was a 40 million attack. So this attack, it was ultimately targeted at server infrastructure, but it started by targeting individuals, which is what such APT actors are very specialized in doing. Um, and um, speaking of exploits, uh, for example, when we started, Armorize, uh, in back in 2006, we needed a way to sustain the company and make some money. Um, so we did take on one project, and it was, we had quite a bit of debate whether to take on that project, but in the end, we took it. It was work for the Taiwanese government. Uh, the Taiwanese government regularly buys zero-day exploits from various sources. We were not there to help them buy, but we were there to verify that what they bought actually worked and that was actually a zero day, right? So, and that's back in 2006. So from, from what we know, most governments um, have this type of budget and have been doing it for more than a decade now. So uh, the, the, there has been a very mature market to buy these exploits. And when you have a zero day, um, it makes it so much easier for you to compromise an individual. The compromise is such that um, you open up a PDF file, open, you open up a Word file, and then you directly get infected because it's a zero day. It's a vulnerability that the vendor doesn't know about and hasn't patched. Um, and then with now, now with uh, the hacking of these exchanges, uh, we expect that the zero day uh, uh, exploit economy is gonna grow a lot because of the monetary return behind using such zero days. In the past, it was mostly to collect intelligence, but now, um, even if you spend half a million, which is already a lot today, uh, to buy a zero day, um, you can hack and exchange for hundreds of million. Uh, another notable incident in July 2017, is uh, the Korean, I'm sorry, the Israeli exchange Coindash's hack. Uh, it was very simple. Um, they used a WordPress uh, arbitrary file upload vulnerability. Um, and uh, on their first day of, the IC, uh, of their ICO, the actor changed their 
ether address, official ether address to an address by the hacker, right? Um, and it was a known WordPress vulnerability. They uploaded a web shell, um, and then they, they just modified the, the, the front page. So this we call an OWASP top 10 vulnerability. Okay. May 2016, Hong Kong News Exchange, Gatecoin. Um, they claim that 95%, uh, th this was one example that we like to use because a lot of exchanges will claim that they're putting 95% or how many percent of the assets in, in code, code storage. But um, it's, it's very hard to secure the code base, right? You, um, and when, when your code base is modified, um, either you have script-based code and it's very easy to modify or um, they reverse your, jo uh, your, your Java app. Uh, however the case is, if they're able to modify the code, then, what, then you have this happening. And that is, yes, they were using code storage, but their code base was modified. And so these assets weren't actually stored in code storage. And when they found out, um, they've been hacked of 2 million. Uh, the last one. Uh, in 2018, my either wallet, DNS hijacking. Uh, this was not against uh, the my either wallet DNS servers, and it wasn't against even against the, uh, Amazon Route 53. This was an upstream DNS um, server that uh, was um, was played with uh, BGP hijacking. Uh, we don't know where where the upstream server is. It's somewhere in Chicago, but because of that. Um, they were able to reroute uh, DNS resolutions to uh, the actor's uh, IP, and in two hours, uh, um, they stole more than 500 ethers. Okay, so, so the above uh, mentioned four incidents, these were all against server architecture. So incidents like these uh, are what we define as category, as first category. And um, they're really attacking server or web application vulnerabilities. And by that, we mean OWASP top 10, remote exploits or rootkits, command or SQL injections, remote command execution, local file inclusions, arbitrary file uploads, business logic flaws. Um, Known, and, and I have seen a few myself, um, a few exchanges that were hacked with business logic flaws. Um, coupon codes, uh, reward tokens that can be unlimitedly generated uh, once, the, once you figure out their API, things like that. Uh, known vulnerabilities in open source packages server misconfiguration, admin credential theft, as we have seen um, with the uh, Korean APT actor hack uh, against the uh, Korean exchange, DDoS, and DNS hijacking. Okay, insider threats. So, uh, we classify, we've included insider threats in this category. Uh, Anyone want to take a guess what, what was the biggest ever insider threat in terms of dollar loss? Mongox, Mongox yep. Good job. So Mongox, uh, they were hacked, but they didn't lose that much. Um, it's estimated that they only lost 7,000 Bitcoins, uh, and the, the other 580 uh, Bitcoins were due to internal theft. So this actually doesn't happen only to Mongox. We see a lot of this case where um, for the earlier exchanges, when they get hacked, management just panic and they lose a few million and they just say, well, we'll just say that we're totally hacked and we'll, we'll take the rest. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, we, we also list here Coin, uh, CoinSecure. This was, I believe, a few months ago, an Indian exchange, hacked for 3.5 million insider theft and shaped, uh, sh Shapeshift, a Switzerland exchange that lost some money to do insider theft um, because an ex-employee ex sold um, some creds 
to the actor. So if we draw um, from blockchain graveyard all of the instance list there, and we look at the category one attacks and the, the loss in terms of dollar volume, not in terms of the number of incidents, but in terms of the damage that's done, then we end up with this graph. Uh, you can see more than half are server attacks. So these are server misconfiguration, remote exploitation, um, DDoS, DNS hijacking, things like that. App breaches, these are um, vulnerabilities inside a custom written application, uh, like a uh, crypto bank or a or centralized exchange, um, vulnerabilities that the developers introduced in their own code base. That's about 30%. Insider, uh, insider threats, it appears to be small, um, but it, sh it should be a lot bigger. Actually, many uh, um, incidents are debatable whether there was a real security outside breach or it was inside a threat. And then code wallet breaches uh, account for 11%. These are code wallets that whose, uh, whose integration with the servers have been manipulated. Okay, category two, individual focused attacks. And these are, uh, for example, malware uh, infections against endpoint devices or for example, credential fish or email fish. So it's my opinion that in a more decentralized model, um, individuals are even more responsible for their assets. So whenever I hear, oh, um, the blockchain is more secure because of this and that, I don't necessarily agree. Um, because when you're holding crypto assets, a lot of times in a decentralized model, you have to be responsible for your own security. If you lose your private key, if you lose your wallet, um, you lose everything. If you get infected, you lose everything in a fully decentralized model. Nobody can help you. And therefore, um, maybe the engineers like us can perfectly keep ourselves secure or at least to a certain extent, uh, when, when uh, crypto gets wider adoption, right? can the moms and, and pops and the grandmas keep themselves secure in a more decentralized model? Um, and even in a centralized model in the crypto economy, let's say you're keeping all of your crypto assets with a centralized online crypto bank. Um, from my experience, because uh, I worked with many banks, uh, they're our customers, um, these banks, they have layers and layers of security check, right? They will never consider you to be who you are just because you have the right password. They have to see the time of your login, the IP address if you log in, your browser language, this and that. And, we're not, and when they're not happy, um, they're just going to disallow you to do your transactions or they'll just disallow you to use your credit card. It will cause a lot of conveni uh, inconvenience, but it's a way to for them to protect their users. In the crypto space, we haven't seen that done a lot, right? So um, although let's say you, um, you're, you don't want to be responsible or your mom or your grandma don't want to be responsible for these assets, and so you have them place these assets at an online crypto bank. But when they get infected, when they lose their credentials and some attacker out somewhere um, logs in from a very different IP at a very different location, today, many of these online banks and exchanges will not flag that. So um, the way I see it, I don't see the crypto economy right now as being more secure than the traditional economy. Um, plus, the stakes are now much higher when a lot of times, like when, uh, when ransomware infects your device, you may say, well, yeah, well, right, well, well I'll, I'll reinstall. 
right? But if that device happens to be having your only copy of your private key, uh, it's, then, then what are you going to do? Uh, so all of a sudden, it's kind of, I kind of think of it as uh, in a fully decentralized model, am I just uh, going to pile up a whole, whole lot of cash in my home, and so I have to build a bank, I have to build a safe, I have to make sure that there's no fire, blah, 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 while in a centralized, traditional way, banks can take care of that for me, and they're insured, right? So I can, I can feel pretty good. Um, um, but I do feel that regardless of whether you agree or not, the stakes are just higher. The stakes are higher when, when you have crypto assets, then the stakes are higher when you personally get infected. Um, so individual focused attacks, let's get into this category. Uh, crypto focused malware, this includes uh, browser main in the middle, targeting centralized exchanges and banks, wallet, stealing malware, clipboard manipulation malware, and API key theft. Uh, okay, so let's talk about uh, crypto-focused uh, malware, uh, browser main in the middle. So uh, uh, with uh, the traditional malware that infects your PC, they will put themselves as browse, browser in the middle, and they'll recognize, they, they have a big database of all of the login URLs and, and forms of uh, a lot of the online banking websites that they target, right? So they'll sit in the middle, and the way that they sit in the middle is uh, they will be able to see encrypted traffic, HTTPS, is no problem for them because the point of interception or hooking is already past the stage of de decryption. So the way they hook into the browser is always after the browser's decrypted HTTPS traffic. So they're gonna be able to see everything. And they have all these patterns. So when you are logging in to um, any of their targeted uh, e-banking websites, they'll recognize the URL, they'll, they'll know which part are the credentials, they'll then take that, um, and as what we've shown in our previous talk, they'll immediately notify the attacker, a lot of times through ICQ. Right? They have all of these tools hooked up um, so that the attack, when you log in, the attacker gets a message of the login creds, and then they'll, they'll, tunnel, they'll try to tunnel um, to an IP range that's close to you and log in with the same creds. That's traditional um, uh, banking malware, but now a lot of these banking malware have crypto, uh, crypto capabilities. What do we mean? Um, they recognize a lot of the major exchange login URLs. So while trying to steal your e-banking creds, they're also now stealing uh, your crypto creds. This is an, an actor that we have uh, been tracking for a very long time. This screenshot is taken live by us. Uh, we have access to their backend databases for for most of the actors that we track, we have access to their backends. So this one, uh, we specifically wanted to show because it has very good support for centralized crypto exchanges. Um, and as you can see, when we captured this a few days ago, um, they have uh, about 45,000 infected endpoints. So out of these 45,000, whenever one endpoint logs in to a major crypto exchange that they have a signature for, then they're gonna get notified in the back end and then they'll log in and try to move your coins out or your tokens out. Yep. What, what does this mean by Russia 80 in 2021? Does it mean that 80 or 31% is infected? Yes, the, where, where the endpoints are. Okay. Yep, where the endpoints are. Yes, definitely. Um, but now, and that's why uh, these actors have worked hard on their, mo uh, on their Android malware. The Android malware will also intercept the SMS and everything, right? So, and that's why they love um, uh, infecting your mobile versus your PC. When they infect your PC, usually the 2FA doesn't work for them. But on the mobile side, it will, they can do it.
So um, once they have a lot of these creds, one thing that we have seen, which is uh, still pretty new, is that uh, they sometimes will launch an API-based attack. And this was done twice already to Binance, once in March and uh, the other time just, uh, I think, two weeks ago maybe. So, uh, for example, in March what they did is um, they had a large number of compromised Binance accounts where um, they had the API credentials, okay? Um, these API, uh, Binance doesn't allow you just, just through that API, move the assets out, transfer the assets out. So what they did is they prepared 31 accounts that they owned, okay? And they kept on stealing the API credits, so they had a lot of API credits here. And right here, they had their 31 accounts where they could move, the, where they registered with fake passwords, and they could move the assets. And then, all of a sudden, one day, they placed, they chose a very small coin, which was a VIA in March, and then they placed very, very high orders using these 31 accounts, right? And here, everybody started to dump at very high price. Um, so they sold these uh, uh, VIA coins using Bitcoin at very high price, all of a sudden driving the price up 10,000 times and then moved the funds out. This happened uh, about two weeks ago again, uh, and this time for a, a 45 million loss uh, to Binance. Um, again, chose a small coin, SYS, and Binance had to uh, uh, immediately shut down all their API and reset all API keys. Okay, so, uh, so that was uh, credential uh, theft by compromising mostly endpoints, uh, PCs or uh, mobile devices. This is a, another backend that we have access to. So we took the screenshot ourselves. Uh, it's a clipboard manipulation uh, malware. Malware that will replace the content of your clipboard. So when you are copying um, your uh, or your friend's um, wallet addresses, when they recognize this address, they'll replace it with their own address, right? So when you copy and paste, you end up pasting their address and transferring the crypto assets into their um, it, it, into their wallets. So this is how the backend looks like. Okay, and the, those are the, the wallet addresses that they recognize, the wallet, um, the coins. Uh, Crypto-focused malware types, so uh, those are just some examples of crypto malware. And um, so prominent families include uh, Windows, um, Azure, uh, Glory Ninja, Diamond Fox, TrickBot, and then we have Android malware, and we also have some Mac OS uh, malware, Coin Thief and Proton. Okay, aside from individual uh, uh, malware that, in, that infect individuals, this category also include other types of attacks against individuals. Phishing, scam, a vulnerable client software, duplicated passwords, crypto mining malware, crypto jacking, uh, and ransomware. We'll briefly give examples. This is a phish against my Ether wallet. It's myetherwalletS.com. Uh, this is a scam. This is another scam um, appearing to be Vitalik uh, asking you to send him some Ether. Uh, vulnerable software, Parity and Go Ethereum, had a uh, RPC API uh, that had an absence of access control, and so for over two years, uh, this actor used uh, here what we call a passive port scanner to find out all clients that uh, that was listening on port eight five four five. And over a period of time, they managed to steal more than 38,000 ethers from these two client-based wallets because they just had, they required no password um, to access their uh, RPC API.
uh, duplicated passwords. This is a commonly used uh, uh, attack. It's uh, the, ec uh, the economy, and in our previous talk, uh, we, uh, we disclosed how they run this economy, and we also disclosed how they run their marketplace. The marketplace is kind of like eBay. Uh, it's, uh, it has quite, a, quite some functionality. Um, this is where these uh, attackers uh, leverage known vulnerabilities most of the time, and uh, steal credentials from websites, whichever website, uh, WordPress, forums, whatever, right? And then they manage throughout compromising these websites, they get your email and the password in plain text, has to be in plain text, that you used um, to, uh, to register and to log in this website because people tend to use the same passwords. And then they'll submit, they'll, they'll, they'll have the, these long list of text, uh, text files. And uh, these marketplaces will have fixed uh, formats, usually CSVs. And they'll upload it. And then immediately, uh, these marketplaces will run scripts to test these uh, um, emails and passwords against Facebook and Gmail and this and that. And then, Based on how many creds work, uh, the seller gets paid. Okay? So it's a mature economy, and now they're doing it against crypto too. So um, if, you're, if a victim is using the same password, for example, uh, for a crypto forum, um, then, then when this forum is hacked, the forum would not know. They wouldn't do anything to the forum. That's how this economy works. They only take what's in the database, and they sell it here, right? But for users that have the exact same password and the exact same email for these exchanges, then uh, the attacker script is going to flag their accounts and they'll log in and they'll move their assets. And this is, and this is why when you have crypto assets, you just do never, like for me, um, I have about seven to 800 passwords in my online vault and I never, I never generate passwords myself. It's always machine generated. Every single website is different, and that's what—that's the the minimum that everyone should do if you have crypto assets. Uh, the above mentioned attacks against individuals can also be used to target businesses by targeting the team members of those projects or businesses, as we have seen with Ubit. Um, it was first. Uh, through infecting, uh, through spare e uh, email spare phishing to infect an employee. Um, and we have also seen it with uh, Banker. Uh, this happened, I think, yesterday or the day before. Um, Banker is a decentralized exchange, but uh, they were hacked, uh, I think, yesterday for 23 million because the team's wallet private key got stolen. And uh, it's unclear yet, but most likely uh, the attacker used one of the above mentioned techniques and targeted one of their uh, engineers and infected the engineer's notebook or computer and through that got their uh, private key and took all, the, all their um, uh, coins out of their wallet. Okay, so we've covered two categories. One is server-centric, and the other one is individual-centric. And now we move on to the third type, blockchain-specific attacks. Uh, here are some potential attacks that we have not seen in the wild, uh, but it's worth mentioning. In August 2017, crypto uh, cryptographic vulnerabilities in I IOTA curl um, hash function, that's why they say you never design your own hash function, uh, because they're very hard to get right. It was identified by MIT DCI and was replaced with SHA-3. Uh, earlier this year, as uh, Goss mentioned yesterday, it, the Eclipse issue with Go Ethereum 1.7, that was fixed in 1.8. Uh, and we, so these two are vulnerabilities that that was found, that were found 
that were fixed that were not yet used in the wild, at least we've not seen. Uh, there's another project worth mentioning, large uh, Bitcoin Collider project that have uh, generated 30,000 trillion private keys uh, to test out collision, and they've only collided uh, seven Bitcoin wallets. So it, seem, it would seem that the collision problem um, is, uh, is right now not of an issue for Bitcoin. 50% attacks. Have, we have seen quite a few success cases this year with 51% attacks. The biggest one uh, being with Bitcoin, Bitcoin Gold, BTG, for 18.6 million. Uh, it's rumored in the community that the, attack, uh, the actor rented nice hash at 0.12 Bitcoins per minute to launch this attack. Uh, Zencash was also attacked uh, and lost 0 0.55, uh, half a million. And this year we also saw Mona and uh, XVG. XVG uh, was, not, was not by sheer computing power or hashing power. Uh, they had a consensus algorithm bug with their time stamping. And so they were exploited that way for three million. Um, when we look at these numbers, it would seem that three million is small and 18 million is not big. But you have to understand, um, in the traditional world, these actors have to work really hard to make not, not, not this much money. Okay? So if you look at the exploits, they're not very hard. Um, but the payoff is, is always in millions, which in my opinion is a new world for these actors that we have been tracing for a long time. Um, there was a research earlier uh, by a professor in Brazil that, uh, that they believe that uh, a 51% attack against Ethereum would only cost 55 million to 85 million per 1 billion of profit. We don't know if that's true, uh, but I think it's worth looking into. These 51 attacks... Ethereum Classic, right? Oh, Ethereum Classic, sorry. Ethereum Classic. Um, from what we have seen in the community, uh, uh, we have seen a lot of talks of these 51 attacks uh, being planned, not, for, not only for uh, financial gains, but to defeat people that they don't like, let's put it this way, um, because um, they, they feel that they have a good opportunity at succeeding, especially uh, when a token is depreciating and they're losing miners. So if you look at any site that lists uh, the cost of 51% uh, attacks against different uh, networks, you can see that the unpopular networks almost cost nothing, zero, right? That's because these, um, and a lot of these are just not very successful ICOs. They don't have enough miners. Um, and so if people just wanted to play with their network, wanted to do a demo or don't like them somehow, I think this could likely happen more than before moving forward because we do, we are, it's, uh, it's only half, half through this year. We're already seeing a lot and also on the street, we're hearing a lot. Smart contract vulnerabilities. We look at these as Similar to OWASP's top 10 vulnerabilities, they're the hardest category to get right because they're vulnerabilities introduced by different uh, projects, uh, different development teams. And so um, as more and more code gets written, um, they will just exist a lot. My own opinion is Solidity could do a much better job at their design. Um, in preventing developers from making these mistakes, uh, but I don't know if that uh, if that's uh, that would happen. Uh, I like the NCC Group's top ten vulnerability category, so I've listed them here. 
re-entry access control, energy overflow, underflow, unchecked, low level calls, denial of service, bad randomness, front running, time manipulation, short addresses, and unknown unknowns. So the first one, maybe uh, the most prominent one, and the first one was the DAO hack of um, more than 50 million that we all know about. Um, we categorize it as a smart contract vulnerability. Um, and um, in July 2017, we had the uh, Parity client having a delegate call vulnerability, and it was hacked. Well, it was hacked once in July 2017 for 30 million, and in fixing that vulnerability in November 2017, one of the engineers made a mistake that locked more than 300 million of, of funds um, for Parity. In April uh, 2018. The Chinese uh, Meitu uh, uh, portfolio, BEC, had an energy overflow that caused them to lose more than a billion in market cap um, because Meitu is a very prominent player um, in, in Asia. And I, I personally know BEC's investors, so I kind of felt that this was uh, quite a high profile, um, smart uh, contract vulnerability exploitation. Um, that happened recently. So we foresee smart contract vulnerability and exploitations to occur more and more down the road uh, be because we see a lot of um, ICOs, ICO teams not having the caliber of engineering required to get their smart contracts right. So in this talk, we covered the three main attack vectors, uh, and we classify them according to the target of attack, server-centric, individual-centric, and smart contract, and chain-specific. OK, uh, that's, uh, that's my talk. Thanks a lot. It's uh, research that uh, together uh, we did with Sang Huang. Um, he is not here today, but a lot of credit goes to him. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, great talk. I like to like to hear the, the talk. Um, you you have showed us. Um, um, APT actor, what is an APT actor uh, uh, called uh, Lazarus? And is, is Lazarus a team or an individual hacker? Um, APT actors are actors that are using a lot of um, more advanced uh, techniques and they are quite persistent. You will see them persisting their tools, their code base, their method of attack for many years. They're called um, advanced persistent threat actors. Uh, many of them are state-backed. Uh, state um, uh, I'll say for Taiwan, for example, um, I think starting from the 2000, uh, our government procurement law state, uh, uh, required that we, uh, pu we publish a lot of our purchases. So since then, you would see on our government website, uh, every year we're building all these exploits and botnets and this and that, right? So in my opinion, it's very funny because you're not supposed to disclose <laughs> what, what we're building, um, but they have to do that to get a fair bit from vendors. Uh, many, many, I think most countries now have this type of capacity as a part of their intelligence collection network. Uh, so these are what we refer to as, as APT actors. Um, and uh, you, you mentioned um, the, the exchanges being hacked, uh, like uh, Mt. Gox and whatever. H have you followed up on them? And what, ha what, what happened to th those exchanges? Or did they run out of business, depreciated? What happened to them? Did, did you follow up the, um, the story from, afterwards? From time to time, from what I understand, um, Mongox 
very interestingly, it seems that they're able to pay everybody back now because uh, the little Bitcoin that they had left now appreciate it so much <laughs> that, okay. that they can pay everybody back. Um, this time, uh, coming out to, to look for what I want to do next, uh, one of my co-founders called Winston, uh, he wasn't originally on my Armorize team. I met him five years ago when uh, he ran Taiwan's first exchange, matching exchange. He ran it for seven months before it got hacked. Uh, so um, they lost about 800 Bitcoins at the time, and he personally paid back every single user in two days and then took the code base to us. Look, we looked at the code base and we said, never, never do it again. Because <laughs> they, they, they announced that they're going to relaunch soon. And I said, no way. With this team, you're not going to do it. Um, so I think uh, most of the major exchanges have been hacked. And a lot of it do not make the news ever. Right now, they make so much money that it's OK for them. Um, the, 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 the money that they make fund their very expensive education process in learning how to get their stuff secure. Uh, that, that's how we see it. Some smaller exchanges get hacked and then never come back, like my friends. Yeah. Thank you. Very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if um, you mentioned uh, state-based actors uh, quite a lot. Uh, is this becoming something that's mostly state-backed? And if so, um, who are the main players? And is this, uh, is this evolving into some kind of or into plain warfare? Um, state-based actors have been around for a very long time. It's, in my opinion, it's just how countries allocate their intelligence budget. Um, like, uh, there, there, there are a lot of intelligence that countries collect, and um, they collect through the traditional intelligence network. They trade with other countries. All of them, starting maybe 15 years ago, started to allocate more and more budget um, for their cyber teams. Um, and they'll, com they'll, they'll, compare, they'll compare the in intelligence collected, right? Like, this time, if there's an important, uh, important uh, event happening in Europe where all the world leaders are, uh, maybe they want to know who is meeting who and they're, what are they talking about, right? So um, for every one of these uh, targets that they want to collect intel, they will eventually compare what they're getting from their traditional network and what they're getting from their cyber team. And I think m most countries have found their cyber team to be very effective. They spend little budget, they, they get a lot of intel. Um, so, so they tend to grow that piece. When, but this is not only data collection, right? This is also taking action, uh, right? They, um, from what I know, they, they do take action. Uh, for example, when, when, you, when, when, when they have somebody's email, a lot of times it's not only the intel that you get from the email, it's usually that you get some information that they do not want you to disclose, and then they, you have a point of pressure against that individual. Um, yeah. So, and then, and then what happens is uh, usually state-backed uh, teams are quite well-funded and resourceful. So, and then after a few years, when they quit their job, and then they may then end up being just uh, in, in, a, in a crime organization, right? And, and that kind of, in, in my opinion, that, that grows the, the, the crime part of this picture because they're, they're, they're equipped with uh, very advanced skills that they acquired while in a state-backed organization. Um, how tense is the situation between Taiwan and China regarding cyber uh, security? Uh, it used to be really tense. Uh, we used to have to um, sleep in the server room because, <laughs> because the attack was so intense. 
uh, that was when I was serving my military. Uh, they have moved away from us. Um, they have other interests. Taiwan is not of the highest interest to them anymore. <laughs> Thanks for your talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, are we 100% safe with hardware wallets? Um, with the hardware wallets, the, I think we are very safe. I, I feel that um, losing the hardware wallet is an issue. Um, at the same time, I have personally seen so many hard disks and notebooks um, whose manufacturers were, were compromised by actors and so they ship with malware installed in, bio, uh, in BIOS, in the BIOS or somewhere in the flash. Um, so if that starts to happen with the coat wallet vendors, then that's a concern. We haven't seen that yet, but I've seen a lot of that with hard disks and notebooks. Yep. Just, uh, if I may add to your point, uh, most hardware wallets have a web interface, so you are still vulnerable to all of the injection attacks and whatever on your browser, so that's also an issue. Yes, yes. Not really a question. Yes, sorry. yes, totally, totally. On other way, why let you have a display of what the transaction is doing? So no. even if your browser is uh, m malicious, yeah. you still see that you are not sending the right amount to the right address, at least for basic transactions. You may not notice it. That's the thing. Well, if you don't read it, that's quite your fault, I'd say. Yeah, sure, but it's an attack. <laughs> if your browser is infected, you're, um, you're easily compromised. Um, because uh, a browser may in the middle, they always modify HTML, right? And intercept HTML. So you yeah, just. I think the other way it displays the amount and the target of the transaction. So you still know with what you are interacting and how much money you rule while are sending. Yep. So I've got a couple of questions. Thank you for the great survey. So yesterday we've seen like uh, actually uh, some of the issues that are uh, more about research and how do we, we should build protocols, blockchain protocols, or I call it infrastructure security. So today we have seen more on software, the vulnerabilities, the malware, and uh, so I see that we have two problems. One problem is with building the protocols in the technology. And the other one is with the awareness of how to use this, what are the tools and software to this. So uh, do you think that either Bitcoin or the other blockchains around are really mature to be used like, uh, or can we use it like with vigilance or? Um, I so, think. So a lot of people are skeptical. I, I don't. Um, no, I, I think um, like from yesterday's talk, I, I think um, every event that I go to, I see, I see this space having attracted so much talent, right? Um, and and with so much talent, and and people finding lots of potential and theoretical uh, attack vectors, and proposing fixes, I personally, from my experience, I see it as very healthy and. And I, I, um, I see the whole space as growing and getting secured at a very good speed. Versus when I was uh, like I was involved in some of the W3C meetings where where, where we were expecting out um, all the internet protocols. Uh, people knew very little about security, right? HTTP and HTML, but today it still worked. Um, but but in the, the design of the blockchain and all these newer networks, in my opinion, 
are already comparatively super secure versus what we designed in the past. And with the, the amount of talent that we're right now able to pull into this, um, into this ecosystem, into this community, uh, I, I'm, I just see it as very promising. I, but, but of course, um, it's still a, it's growing at a tremendous speed, but it's still ver a very new space. So there's some time until our mom and pops get to hold crypto securely. Um, it takes some time. Uh, yeah. Uh, another question is that there's been a discussion in our group, research group, with the security guys. And one of the guys is a senior. Actually, he said that it's very dangerous, actually, to put all this stuff in the public. So all the like research and in the practices, actually, there's been some kind of like hide everything in the databases, hide your keys, the, your passwords, uh, put firewalls and this kind of thing. And now it's very open, like everyone has everything on his machine. And that's dangerous because but originally, like cryptography was not built for for this. What was not built to put in the public. So that's why, like, they use a lot of firewalls and this kind of stuff. And now, like, they think that it's dangerous now to put this in the public. So, could you comment on this? Um. Yeah. Well. Um. I think. Uh. With the, uh, it's the it's the world we're in today, right? So, um, if you like, for a couple of years we were doing uh, malvertising detection and just studying how how of all the ways that the advert advertisers can track us and all of the the personal information that's exposed on these advertising platforms. Um, I think the uh, the technology grew so quickly. Um, people weren't aware that all of this information is used to track them. Yes, that's true, um, but it, I, 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 I do think, I, I do see the industry addressing a lot of these problems. Um, and also from a practical perspective, like, like today what, what we're showing are all of the attacks that actually have happened, right? Um, and so, we, I, I think um, what we can do is we can discuss all of the privacy breaches that have happened or, by, uh, or all of the bad stuff that have happened by us allowing so much data to be in the public. And then we address that. Um, be, because, because, like, if, we, if I'm to review the internet protocol as it exists today, I'll say it's super unsecure. Whoever designed it is, but... I don't think it's caused too too much of a problem. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, I have another. I'm not sure if you have an important que uh, question. I have a personal question. Like uh, you, you've mentioned that you have uh, thousands of something of passwords, and you have a tool for that. So could we know what do you recommend which, which as a vendor? tool? To, um, to, uh, <laughs> Like so, so I'll explain how they work. The, or the vendor I use, <laughs> we like very much. They have been hacked once, so I don't want to recommend them. Uh, but so, so, so how, how these um, online password vaults work is um, you have a, you, um, all your passwords are stored in an encrypted format on their server. Um, and so they'll typically use JavaScript to download all of your passwords in encrypted format and ask you to enter a decryption passphrase, which they don't keep at the server, to, to decrypt the passwords. Um, once de decrypted, um, it depends on whether the JavaScript, once you use a password, uh, the, it depends on whether the JavaScript tries to scramble the memory, right? Because you can have a piece of malware that is sniffing through the, scraping through the memory that's trying to find your passwords. Uh, um, if they want to be thorough, then they have to scrape the memory as well using JavaScript somehow. Uh, the vendor that I use have been hacked once. Uh, nothing has happened. Ob uh, apparently, the attacker was not able to decrypt people's password. Um, so, so that's the state of things for me. Yeah, but but I I never use, 
I never use a password that I generate myself. It's always all autogen, always. Uh, do you think it's uh, safe to use uh, the open tools like KeePass or something? Well, no, I, I don't use people's devices ever. Oh. Yeah, I don't. Uh, and, um, and I have 2FA for many things. Yeah, uh, my previous company uh, was uh, strictly Linux. Nobody can use a PC or a Mac. Uh, with the new company, we've degraded to Macs. <laughs> 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 Linux is too hard sometimes. Yeah. But you're, you're okay with the. Uh, but you're okay with having your even encrypted. You're okay with having your passwords on the cloud. Uh, Wouldn't yeah. you rather have them yourself locally? Yeah, uh, at, uh, at Proofpoint, uh, we have vaults that are run by our own data center. Uh, but as a startup, we don't have that IT resource. Um, but there are many, many enterprise-grade vaults that, that I think are pretty good um, that, that we can use. Yep. Uh, what, what, what the problem with us is because all of our server credentials are there, sometimes these online vaults go out of service. And then our company goes out of service. We can't work because we don't have our credits. Yep. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, this. You mentioned these web, web attacks. Uh, uh, say web in the middle. Man in the middle. Man in the middle. Uh, and also mentioned the, the, this uh, the injection or the the upload of, of files or. To, to web server in order to hack the web server. Uh, do you think that the, these public cloud infrastructures like the Amazon and, 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 and Azure, Microsoft Azure, do you think, aren't, aren't they protected, uh, these this hacks, these uploads of, of, of files to, to a web server? Aren't they, aren't, aren't they supposed to, pr to, pr to protect people, users, from, from, from these attacks? Um, the, the infrastructure itself? Yeah. my. My, uh, our experience in, ex in, in helping, with, uh, helping our customers, uh, enterprises, my personal opinion is, for example, email. I think Gmail is so much safer than a lot of enterprise emails. Um, just because the sheer talent pool that Google has. A lot of my really good friends, really good researchers got hired into Google. Um, and also Google just has so much money to throw at this whereas um, enterprises don't. So like for us, we just use, we just use Google Apps. Uh, that's one. And then um, um, I think uh, AWS and uh, especially AWS and a lot of these uh, bigger companies have been hacked so much. And uh, I used to be very happy about certain vulnerabilities, and, and I still have some that I talk, uh, that I found in, in Google, right? Because every time you find a Google vulnerability, they treat you very well, and you can give a talk and get some credit. So over time, um, I think uh, these, these larger infrastructure is just going to be more secure than privately built ones. Thank you very much for your talk and for the audience. Uh, now let's have a coffee break and let's gonna start uh, again the next session at 11, okay? Uh, so that's it, thank you.